was sitting on a train between two old ladies, older ladies, seasoned ladies, <laughs> shall I say. And the two started grumbling and complaining about the window on the train. Should it be closed or should it be open? And one said, you know, I'll, I'll die of heat if it stays closed. And the other says, well, if it's open, I'm going to freeze to death. And this went on for 10, 15 minutes until finally the ticket puncher guy came by and asked for their tickets and they decided, well, what do you think? What do you think we should do? And he says, sorry, ladies, I stay out of these things. Very wise man. But the man in the middle decided at that time, it's time for me to pipe up and say something. And he says, I've got the solution. I know. Let's close the window and one will die off and then we'll open the window and the other will die off. <laughs> problem solved. But the reality is, is that life is, is full of problems, right? And we really have to figure out a way to solve them without killing each other. Sometimes the solutions are not as easy as an open, closed type of thing. Sometimes the solutions take uh, some real wisdom and discernment and direction and, and patience with the Lord and grace with one another. And in Acts chapter 5, I'm sorry, chapter 6, what we see is a problem that arises within the church. And if it's not dealt with wisdom, it could really cause a lot of problems. Ruin the fellowship, divide families, destroy the church. How do they proceed? And what we want to take to heart is that there's things for us to note, not only about this house that we call home, a house of worship, but the house that you live in, in your home. It's a little church, so to speak. It's a little place of worship. And there are four different C's in our verses, verses 1 through 7. There is the conflict that we're going to face. There is a counsel that we need to hear. There is the course that we need to follow and a conclusion that we need to know. And so let's read through. We're just going to go through the first seven verses of chapter 6, and then we'll kind of pick some things apart. Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Bacchorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. The conflict that arises in verse 1. We want to note a few things about this, what surrounds this conflict. The first thing you might note is that there is growth. There is growth. It says there, in those days when the number of, multi of disciples was multiplying. I mean, there are good things going on. The church is growing. In chapter 2 and 3, we saw that the Lord was adding to the church. They went from 120 to 5,000. And then in chapter 5, we saw this subtraction from the church as Ananias and Sapphira made a huge mistake. And now we see a multiplication of the church. The disciples are growing. And it's often said that God will purify his church, like verse 5, before he multiplies his church, like verse 6. And you may see in your life or in your family a time of what's noted as blessed subtraction or a difficulty. Don't lose heart that God has kicked you to the curb or thrown you aside, that he's never going to do anything with you anymore. Uh, you may be in a chapter 5 and chapter 6 is right around the corner. But God does those things. I, I want to give you six lessons that we note about ministry makings. And this is the first that we see in our chapter. And the first is that the church, God's church, is meant to grow. We are meant to grow up in maturity through the word of God, through prayer, through worship, through fellowship, through evangelism. And we are meant to grow out in ministry. 
up in maturity and out in ministry where we begin to share the love of Christ and show the love of Christ to those around us in our community. It's been said that healthy sheep begat sheep, right? You ever think about that? From a physical point of view, a sheep, sheep, shep, what do they call them? Sheep, right? One of those things. Physically, a sheep will breed one or two times a year. The pregnancy term is five months for a sheep. And so you technically could breed them twice a year. Often it's just once a year. But their, their uh, litter is either one to three little lambs. And, and so when you think about that from a spiritual point of view or a physical point of view, these sheep reproduce themselves every year one to six times. Sheep do. They, they don't start right away when they're right, lambs right away. They wait till about year one or year two where they've grown up to this place where now they're able to reproduce and even their most fruitful years are between ver- year three and six. And so if that's a physical illustration for us to take the spiritual principle, Lord, we want to reproduce. That We really need to look at it that way. Maybe it's one thing to consider. Am I discipling someone? That every year I want to multiply myself one to six times? Wow, that's pretty aggressive. We need to be active. What happens when sheep get older? Well, they either sell them off or eat them. <laughs> that's a different story. You know? <laughs> We're not going there. But the point is, is that the sheep need to reproduce. And that's what's happening in this church. This church, your family, you ask those questions. Are, are, are we growing up in maturity and out in ministry? In, in being a, effective, are we healthy? I think it's the Lord's responsibility to add to the church, and it's the church's responsibility to disciple. God does that work in bringing them. Our work is to disciple and raise them up and send them out to do the work of ministry. The conflict came in the midst of growth to exercise faith. Number two, it involved a particular group. If you'll note there that there arose a complaint against the Hebrews and the Hellenists. Uh, Who were these two groups of people in the church? You know, the Hebrews were the the Jews that were mostly from Judea. They kind of kept to an old school type of tradition in approach to things. And the Hellenists on the other side were the Jews who embraced Greek culture. And the, and the Greek dress and such. And so uh, their approach, they were mostly from all over the Roman world, and they're a little bit more cultural sensitive in the know-how. But the problem was is that the Hebrews began to look at the Hellenists as unscriptural compromisers with Greek culture. And the Hellenists began to look, regard the Hebrews as they're just holier-than-thou, stuffy traditionalists. Sound familiar? We find the same problems even today. Is it suits or shorts on Sunday? Well, those who are more comfortable in suits might be looking down on those with shorts to say, how can you be so disrespectful of God? You need to put on your Sunday best. And those in shorts would be looking up to the suits going, you know what, it's 115 degrees outside. How can you wear a suit? Tension in church. I had a guy email me the other day. And he was asking if we were a biker-friendly church. No, this is all seriousness. He said, I'm composing a list of biker-friendly churches. I wanted to see if you were one of those. And he says, here's what they are. They're they're not going to judge on exterior, but on the working of the Spirit inside. Their leadership is willing to minister to all people. It's a congregation that would accept them as brothers and sisters without regard to their appearance. I said, yeah, add us to the list. But note this, it's a sad day when the church is more concerned with the outside than the inside. It's a sad, sad day. And he wrote back and simply said, I know. By the grace of God, we stand. But do we really have to have those stipulations? How tension tension can arise. So the first lesson is that a church will grow. The second lesson is that as it grows, it hurts. Hashtag growing pains. It hurts. And my daughter, when she was young, would have these leg cramps. 
Uh, and they were growing pains. And we found that it took a warm cloth and a little bit of medicine and a lot of prayer. And she worked through that. And, and I think at times the church has to take that approach. Lord, we need the warmth of your Holy Spirit and your love to abound. We need the, the medicine of your word to be strong on our behalf. And, and we need to just continually pray. Because it hurts are going to happen. In any church, when you have people, myself included, when you have people, you have potential problems, Right? The more people, the more potential problems could occur. It's the normal thing. And some of those problems that arise within any church could be cultural. You, when you think about some people are more inclined towards different ways and how they were raised, how it should be done, their philosophies, whether you use technology or not, and this, that, and the other. Some of it is generational. It's old versus young, you know, in their approach. Some of it is biblical, different views and appearances of, of how scriptures are to be interpreted. And here, this problem that arose between these Hebrews and Hellenists were generational. It was cultural, and, and it was a, a practical problem. Their widows are being neglected in, in the daily distribution of food. And we're not sure if this accusation was completely correct or not. It could be misjudgment. It could be a, a, a bad management. It could be something that they weren't intending to do, but it was just happening. It was happening or appeared to be happening. But what we note this is that Satan is always, he's a chaos maker, isn't he? In my, in my daughter's verbiage, he's sipping on haterade, you know? <laughs> he is, that's what he does. He looks to take little issues and make them massive issues, massive problems because he's out to destroy relationships with each other, with the Lord, with churches, you may be in one of those situations even now and you need to stand your ground in the word and go to prayer and not give the enemy a foothold to destroy. But the church here, as it's growing, there is this issue that comes up. It's possible that the Hebrews had the right heart and the Hellenists had the right facts. They just needed to get on the same page. And yet when we face conflict, sometimes we say, oh, why, why bother, you know, um, It'll just work itself out. You know, it's just a stage we're going through. You know, I like, uh, I saw this, this cartoon thing with Linus and Charlie Brown. And he, his, Linus was telling Charlie Brown, you know, I just, I don't like conflict. I, I avoid them. I have found my philosophy is that there is no problem too big to run away from. <laughs> and that's sometimes our approach. But, but listen, this is really important. If I don't deal with the challenges that arise in my family, in my church, in a godly and wise way. It has the potential to divide the church, the household, the marriage, the family. It has that potential. And yet the solution isn't always easy. It's not always cut and dry. Sometimes it takes both people, spouses, seeking the Lord together. What do we do in this? Sometimes it takes a leadership that's saying, Let, let's listen Let's listen. Sometimes it takes a, a couple going, I, I need to seek some godly counseling on this issue because it really could blow up and be a major problem. And a lot of times it takes compromise on both sides. Participating in a solution and not just standing in your rights. Listen, are, are you a peacemaker or a maker of pieces? Two different things come about. Is it about my rights or is it about the glory and the love of God? The Christian church here is going through some growing pains. There is conflict in the midst of growth between these two groups. And number three, there's a grumbling that's taking place. A complaint, a discrimination, foul. I mean, they threw down the red challenge flag if you're into football. They said, that's time out. This is not right. Our widows are being neglected. They're being overlooked. They're being disregarded in the daily distribution. Interesting, in William Barclay's commentary, he notes this about the synagogue at that time. There was a routine custom in place. Two collectors went around the market and private homes every Friday morning and made a collection for the needy. It was partly money and partly goods. Later in the day, it was distributed. Those who were temporarily in need received enough to enable them to carry on. Those who were permanently unable to support themselves received enough for 14 meals, two meals a day for one week. The fund from which the distribution was made was called the kaffa or basket, 
In addition to this, a house-to-house collection was made daily for those in pressing need, and this was called the tamhui, or tray. And so the Christian church simply took this custom to heart and began to support the widows. And anything you do, you might have good intentions, but there is potential problems. It doesn't go smoothly, and this complaint arises. I think it's quite interesting that this isn't just, hey, I see an observation, and I'm going to file it in with my boss. This is a, has an attitude behind it. The word for the complaint is gongusmos. And I think that's an interesting word because sometimes when we're complaining, we just sound like a noisy gong or a honking goose, right? But complaining really is a, it's a sin in God's eyes. And listen to what Philippians 2 says. Do all things without complaining and disputing. Boy, that's a tough one. And then in 1 Peter 4, 9, be hospitable to one another without grumbling. So what's the church going to do? There's a potential problem on the rise. The storm is brewing. There's people complaining. There's issues happening. And it could get ugly. And so verse 2, the 12 summoned the multitude of disciples together that they would hear the heart that they would all be on the same page, that there would not be a misunderstanding about this issue and what to do. And their counsel here in verses 2 through 4 is threefold. There's a reiteration in verse 2, a proposition in verse 3, and an affirmation in verse 4. The first thing they do is they reiterate their calling. It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. It's not that they couldn't do it, as if they had some disability and couldn't do it. Nor is it that they wouldn't do it because it was too far below them to do. It was that they shouldn't do it. It just wasn't the right thing to do. It wasn't right to take this course. It wasn't beneficial to the whole body. Just as they saw the neglecting of the distribution of food created problems, they saw that the neglecting of the distribution of the word of God would create problems. God's called us to distribute the word, not baskets of food, is what the leadership is standing on. The third lesson might be in the ministry makings is that a leader must be focused on his calling. You'll find this in a church. You'll find this in your family, the same thing. And often what happens is people will see a problem and they can call the pastor. Hey, hey can I set up an appointment with you? I'd like to talk to you about something. And sure, you know, come on in. And we come in and, and sit down. And, you know, um, I, I want to know what's going to happen. I, I see a potential uh, a problem. How come we're not doing this program for the kids? Why aren't the ladies doing these things? What about the men? What about this issue and that issue? And, and uh, what are you going to do about it, Pastor Jesse? And, uh, and what in reality is, is I see the problems, you fix them. And uh, oftentimes it, it will sit down and say, well, those are maybe some real problems. I'm glad you brought them to my attention. How are we going to fix it? Go for it. You see, God lays things on your heart for you to do. I'm so glad you came in to see me. It looks like we're going to have new ministry startup. <laughs> oh, I didn't mean for that. I just wanted to, I'm an observer. No, you're a participant. That's what the Bible tells you. <laughs> you're a part of the body of Christ. Well, what has God laid upon your heart to do? Go for it. Let the ministry arise. When you see a need and you're moved by the Holy Spirit, it's a wonderful working of God. The best ministries are the ones that are birthed out of the heart. I think about Terry and Nina over there. That have, they started the ministry into the, home, uh, the uh, nursing home because Terry's mom was there. Just wanted to bring church service there. And now they have a full-blown church service there every Sunday. I, I think about powwow ministry started in Rachel's heart to, to reach out to the community. And here we are every month. You know, doing that. I, I think about the preschool. We started this preschool because uh, years and years ago, when my youngest son uh, was at that age, I was taking him to another church, to a preschool. And I thought, why, why couldn't we do this at our church? We got the space. Well, I started stirring in my heart. And then he started putting things together. And three years ago, we started it. Four kids. Now there's 60 plus kids that come on this campus on a weekly basis. And the best ministries are the ones that God births from the heart with ears that are open to say, Lord, what do you want to do? Let's go for it. What is God putting on your heart to do? Ministry is not reserved for the professionals. It's reserved for all of us. All of us. But the danger in any ministry, in anything that God is calling you to do, 
Here's the danger. This is what the leadership faced. The danger of the urgent rather than the important. There will always be something pressing, always be something that's loudest. And is that the thing that we're supposed to connect with and do? Oh, but the squeaky wheel gets the oil. Not always in God's book. You keep squeaking. We need to be centered on, on, on what God is calling us to do first in our calling. And secondly, the other things. Make sure that you stay focused on what God is calling you to do. After they reiterated their call in verse uh, uh, 2, they put forth this proposition. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Here's their proposition. It's a reasonable one. It's delegation in the making. They're not just sitting back. They're not shrugging it off. They're saying, hey, let's do something about this. And they put forth this plan. The plan was first to seek out. They weren't sitting back. They all had work to do, participating in this solution. It was to find not one, but seven men. Why seven? Maybe it's just a number of completion. Maybe it's accountability. Maybe it's the workings together. Uh, I don't know. They chose seven. It was a good thing to do. And there was requirements, like a job resume. There were things they were looking for. It wasn't just like, hey, let's grab that guy. He'll do it. Let's get Mikey. He'll eat anything. No, it's not that approach. The leadership laid it out and says, here's what you want to find. You want to find, first of all, good men. Men with a good reputation. Because this little thing of feeding tables, the world is watching and we're very concerned with our witness to the world. Secondly, they not only need to be good men, they need to be godly men, that they're full of the Holy Spirit. That they're leaning upon the Holy Spirit and listening to the Holy Spirit. And thirdly, they need to be gifted men, that they're wise, full of wisdom. Benevolence is a tough, tough ministry. I did it for 20 years, and I'm so glad I can push it off to Mikey now. <laughs> no, it's a hard ministry. How do you do it? What about these needs? How do you deal with this, that, and the other when they happen? Whew, there's no cut and dry. It's hard. But those things were so important to find good, godly, gifted people to do the work of ministry. And that's lesson number four is the simple fact that leaders must delegate out. You, God hasn't called you to do everything. He has called you to do something. But he hasn't called you to do everything. And you need to seek a solution that's the right people in the right place at the right fit for these things to go forward in grace. Think about it in your family. As a parent, God hasn't called you to do everything for your kids. He's called you to help raise your kids and grow your kids up. So when the lawn needs mowing, I can do it myself or I can get my son. <laughs> That's a poison four, right? <laughs> when, uh, uh, you know, a sister needs red to, when a brother needs help with something, you teach your kids, you grow them up. Same thing happens in a church. Oh, there are stages, yes, when you need to be cared for and cuddled and worked through and, and it done for you. But as a general rule, you grow up to maturity in your family and, and you do the work and you learn to bless others. Lesson number five is simply this, that effective ministry is done by spirit-filled people. God is looking to use hearts that are in tune with him. How important that is. Willing to be used by him with a life that is overflowing with his love. That's effective. You see, we need to be full of the Holy Spirit. We need to be full of the Holy Spirit to have effective ministry. Why? Because if I'm not full of the Holy Spirit, I can do a lot of damage it can do a lot of damage. You can look at things and go, man, wow, we got a need for children's workers. Boy, what is wrong with people? Oh, I guess I'll do it. Man, these stupid kids, lazy parents. And you get in there and, and next thing you know, uh, you know, here's what's going to happen. If you don't approach in the right heart, first of all, you're going to be bummed out. You're going to be bummed out because by week two, a baby's going to throw up on you or something's going to happen. Or that parent is going to be late picking up their kid because they're getting prayed for. And you start getting bummed out. And then you start getting burned out. You get burned out. I'm the only one doing this. There's no thanks or anything like that. No one cares about me. I'll just go eat worms. No, 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 no. Stupid people. No, no, no. And you start complaining. So you get burned out, bummed out, and then finally you just bow out. I did my time. Listen, it's not a prison sentence. It's ministry. It's loving others. Ministry is not supposed to be misery. It's supposed to be a joy. You're simply doing what the Lord laid on your heart. 
And when you're full of the Holy Spirit and you're just doing that ministry, guess what happens? You leave a trail in your wake of just people blessed, looking to the Lord and saying, wow, I'm just so blessed by God and his body. But when you do it in the wrong heart and wrong attitude, you know what happens? You leave a trail of bitterness and bummer. And God came to restore lives, not ruin them. And he wants you to be the same way and me as well. The counsel was a reiteration of the call and then a proposition that was reasonable and thirdly, an affirmation of their work. As they say there in verse four, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Why did they say this? They already said it before. It was to affirm their stance. Guys, we're gonna back you by prayer. Know that you're not out there on your own trying to figure it all out. Go for it. And we will back you by prayer. We'll share our experience with you. We'll stay focused in what God has called us to do as you seek out what God's calling you to do. And we'll go forward for the glory of God. Well, how would they respond? Would they say, man, that is ludicrous. You are off your rocker. Can I get a second opinion? They didn't go any of that route. In fact, verse 5 tells us very clearly in the saying, pleased the whole multitude. That's deep. It tells us that that there was wisdom in it that brought peace, brought peace to the hearts. They just wanted God's love to rule. They weren't out for blood. They just wanted God's love to rule. It tells us that they submitted to the counsel of the leadership as well. They were willing to work for a solution and be a part of that and help solve the problem, not just complain. And number three, that they got right to work right away, no delay. And that's true. The wise counsel will promote peace. It will cause us to submit. And it will cause us to inspire activity in each other for the Lord. And that's what happened. Verse 5 tells us there that they chose these seven guys, Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, uh, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And these seven guys they chose, each of them were probably a Hellenist and not a Hebrew because their names are Greek. Just quite fascinating. This shows the great sensitivity to this offended party that they would set over them, not Hebrews, but Hellenists to take care of the widow's distribution. And they presented them before the, the uh, uh, leadership there and the leadership prayed and they laid hands on them in verse six, as, uh, asking for God's guidance and approval. But, but note with me these, a few of these guys. Stephen, we're going to read about next week. He's going to become the first martyr in the church, an incredible Bible expositor. And here he is waiting tables, giving out food baskets. Philip in that list. We know, we see him in chapter 8. He takes the gospel out to Samaria. He expands the ministry out. He shares with people and they get saved. And the Lord does an incredible work. In fact, he influences his family in an incredible capacity. He's got four daughters later on, we read in Acts, that have this gift of prophecy. A wonderful thing. History, church history tells us Procurus would later become an assistant to the Apostle John and would take over the church in Nicodema and was martyred for his faith. He, here's the point I'm making, and this is the sixth lesson of ministry in the makings, is that small ministry leads to big opportunities. Big opportunities come first with the small. If I can't be faithful in the little things, wiping noses, welcoming people, why would God entrust me with larger things? There's an old acronym that stuck in my head when my dad told me one time, Christians need to be fat. Huh? Faithful, available, and teachable. Oh, make me big and fat. For you, Lord. That's what we need. Am I faithful with the little things? Am I available for the small things? Am I teachable or is it always my way? Yeah, how is the Lord working? In the small ways, and the Lord will open up great opportunities from there. The conclusion in verse 7 is because this situation was, was handled with wisdom and sensitivity to those who were offended, a potentially divisive, explosive problem was diffused and the gospel continued to go forth. The fruit was really evident. Note with me, how do I know the wisdom to take on counsel and courses? What's the outcome? What fruit am I looking for? I think this is key. I've learned this throughout the years. James 3, 17 and 18. This is a good testing. You learn from the bad decisions as well as the good ones. But here's what it says. 
The wisdom that is from above is first pure. That is, it creates purity in my life, not self-driven. Then peaceable, that the peace of God will rule the heart. It's gentle, gentleness in hand, that I'm considering the weaknesses of others and not to stumble. It's willing to yield. So I'm yielded to the Spirit's direction. It's full of mercy, having compassion in it, and good fruits is the outcome. It's without partiality. There's no favoritism involved. It's without hypocrisy. There's sincerity of heart. And then he says, now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. They go hand in hand. Righteousness and peace. So how do we see that? What do we see in chapter 5? There are five fruits that we're seeing unfold here on wise, good, godly counsel. Things you can take note of. First, there is peace within the church. The saying pleased the whole multitude in verse 5. And I have to ask myself, when the needs get met and the ministry happening, what's happening in the hearts of people? Is there peace that is ruling and reigning even though we may not have it all figured out? The peace of God is guarding the hearts and minds. Number two, there's the preaching of the word. The word of God spread, it says there in verse 7. It spread. And we have to ask ourselves, are the decision that we're making, is it promoting the gospel? Is it opening the doors to share Jesus with others? Is it, or is it hindering uh, the, those things in, in being used? <coughs> Number three, you look at the people in verse 7. The people, the progress. You see the disciples are multiplying greatly and every ministry ultimately makes disciples of Jesus. That's our goal. And the minister becomes the maker. God calls you to a ministry. People begin to come alongside you. You're grooming them for more ministry. You're discipling them. And then we see that the priest, number four, the priest came to faith in Jesus. And God finally got through. This is quite an extraordinary concept to consider. When you think about in the past five chapters, all that has happened before this. It wasn't the day of Pentecost where the priest finally crumbled in belief. It wasn't at the preaching of Peter, though that's incredibly important because salvation comes with the gospel message and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It wasn't seeing a, a lame man that was healed right before their eyes, a miracle being done. It wasn't through the boldness of Peter. It wasn't through the opening of the prison doors. What finally caused these priests to crack? Love's triumph over the problems. This is just the last piece in the puzzle. Because sometimes we're thinking, oh, if I can get that person to church, they'll hear the gospel. And I pray they do. And I pray they do get saved. Because the gospel is important to that. But it just may be a piece. Oh, God, if you just do a miracle in their life and open the prison doors, then they'd finally see and believe. Well, I, I really pray it happens. Well, what they really need is dot, dot, dot. And finally, what gets them to finally come to see the reality of Jesus Christ and the changes he wants to make is when there's an incredible problem and he sees the love of God manifested and triumph over it, that he goes, wow, wow. By this they will know you are my disciples by the love that you have for one another is what Jesus said. Let's preach the gospel with words and actions. And lastly are the plans. The plans of the enemy were defeated. His plans to divide the church, his plans to distract the leadership. The wise counsel kept them focused and kept the church progressing forward. You see, God won in every way. In every way, he won. And he not just preserved the church here, he expanded it. Go God. The problem is seen, it's tackled, and it's solved. By the power of the Holy Spirit, with men willing to submit to the counsel of the Holy Spirit and the Lord and the leadership there, and going forward to be used by God.